All right, cool. All right. Thanks for joining you guys. Um, I don't know if this is your experience, Jason, with the clients that you like advise do like even sort of passive advisory work on <laughs> unintentional advisory too work. much too much yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but i mean like i get this question all the time uh like how much should i pay myself and i i think the the question like increases in frequency the smaller the business is for sure but it's definitely like when somebody has a emerging business or a business certainly that's like sub 1 million in revenue just call from like a broad perspective they often sort of like wrestle with this question. And I, I think we all have like different, um, we approach this question in different ways, which I think it's why is why it's helpful that the three of us are on here to talk it through. I think my, my approach is like a little bit more philosophical. My sense is, is that yours is a little bit more tactical and Rob's probably somewhere in between. We'll see if that bears out. But um, like where I always start is, the frame that I use in my mind is that like, if I think about revenue as like a finite resource and like cash as an extension of that as a finite resource to a small business, I think of like the cat, the business needs cash and the per the owner needs cash. And they, I sort of visualize this tension between the two things and you can't really like satisfy both and expect both to grow, you know, sort of using like the stream of revenue as like a metaphor, you know, sort of like a plant-based metaphor for, you know, the ability to grow. And so people need, owners need personal income in order to sort of sustain themselves and support their families and, you know, to grow their own personal, like um, to sort of satisfy their own uh, resources. And then the business also needs um, resources to grow in the form of revenue and cash, you know, on hand and all these different ways to deploy cash. So I, I see it work better when the business needs to support the owner, um, like less, I guess, like when the owner doesn't, when the owner needs to grab every penny, I, I find it harder for the business to grow. Um, and I, I've seen it work well in the opposite. Like if you have an owner of a business that has like a different source of income that doesn't need to derive any income, personal income from the business, that can work really well. Um, and so uh, that's that's sort of like the, the framework that I use as a starting point to sort of like explain the concept and explain the sort of like the finite nature of the concept. But I know, um, you know, in some of our discussions, like you approach it from like, a sort of a, a different lens on the tactical side, what comes to mind to you initially when somebody's like, man, how much should I pay myself anyway? Where do you go to that in that question? Start with me? Yeah. Um, well, I think it matters like, why are you even in the business in the first place? Um, and so, and I think you, you hinted on, um, I think the most important is, well, what do you need to live, right? Um, so, I mean, you, you, there's a certain amount of like, you know, if you think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs applied very, very broadly, there's a certain amount of money you need in order to like pay rent and buy food and pay for your car and so on, right? And if you are owning a business and that's your sole source of income, then you need to make sure that that business can provide at least the amount that you need to live. And to live is different to everybody, right? It's different from one person to the next. Um, but I think that, um, you know, a lot of people approach starting a business, especially like earlier stage entrepreneurs or people who are transitioning from a traditional, let's say a W-2 job, and now they're going to be doing contracting. And their original guidepost is, what was I making before? It needs to be at least that much or more. Yeah. And I don't disagree with at least that much, if at least that much equals living, but or more, which isn't also bad, is a risk-adjusted amount of money, right? Like you're taking more risk, so therefore you should make more money, right? But it's not how it always works, right? And there are other intangible factors, I think, at like – you know, did you do this because you wanted to have more free time, because you wanted to own your schedule, because you wanted to, you know, what are the other intangible non-cash or non-money-making factors to how much, you know, should I pay myself? 
Um, so I think to go all the way back to the beginning of your question is, I think it's at least as enough to live. And then the decision is, well, what do you want to then do with the hopefully excess cash? Do you want to reinvest it or do you want to take additional distributions? Um, and, you know, I think that that's a strategy discussion, less so than like, how much should I pay myself? Um, and then also, like, if you, you know, if you have other sources of income, whether it be rental properties, another W-2 job, et cetera, et cetera, then maybe how much do I need to pay myself is zero, right? And then, then you know, you get to make that decision of like every dollar I make, should I be reinvesting back into the business or should I be taking it out for myself to fund other things, whether it be personal things or other business pursuits? So, but I, I think that there has to be a minimum baseline, which is how much do I need to live? And I don't agree that it should always equal how much should I make at my other job? Ah, nice. I like that you ended with like a little, uh, like a zinger there, you know? <laughs> I think, I think you brought up a good point too. And it kind of depends on where you are in the business cycle and whether you're trying to like prove the concept of your business and whether you're able to do that while you're working your current W2. Like, so if you're one of those people who is trying to get a business off the ground and you've got a, you've got current employment or you have a spouse or a significant other that's providing income, can you prove the concept of your business while you're still gaining income from some other source? And if you can do that, to me, that feels like just such a, such a, a better way of, of getting things started rather than putting all your eggs in that basket and trying to prove it and make an income and stay afloat all at the same time. Um, but I, I think the other thing that is important to, to remember too, is that sometimes you get some ancillary benefits from just business being an owner of a business. And so a lot of what you made in your W-2, you were spending after tax dollars on meals and travel, and there's going to be some natural um, expenses that move from kind of post-tax post tax in your previous W-2 life to pre-tax just simply because you're out prospecting for new customers or you're meeting with people and it's just a necessary business expense that you have along the way. And, you know, you can't eat lunch, tw you know, you can't eat lunch twice. So like the fact that you're meeting somebody for lunch to, to expand your business, those are dollars that are spent that maybe in a previous life would have been <clears throat> spent with after tax dollars. So there's, there's in some ways, there might be some tax benefit to entrepreneurial life that doesn't that creates an environment in which your after tax equivalent um, income is similar even if you're technically making technically making less you might not feel it the same way in your lifestyle if that makes sense yeah there's there's a lot to there's a lot to address in what both of you guys um responded with Jason going back to you do you think in the in the scenario that we're moving beyond the the um situation where you've satisfied the amount you need to live um do you think is there like a financial like rubric or do you think about are there any are there any sort of like financial laws that you employ to calculate like what an owner's earnings should be relative to the rest of the like financial machine within the business, like in terms of, you know, percentage of payroll or percentage of revenue, or do you, do you, do you go into that territory or do you, do you look at it a more basic basis of just what do you need to live? What's that ex excess of that? What does the business need? Or do you, do you have like a calculus? No, because they're all different. Um, no. So no calculus, I would say like, you know, if you, if you can meet your basic needs, then you can say, okay, well, with excess cash, what do I want to do with it? Right. Do I want to reinvest it in the business I'm building because I think it can grow? Do I want to take that cash out and start another business? Do I want to take that cash out, and buy a rental property? Or do I want to take that cash out and travel lavishly? Like whatever it is, I mean, that depends on the individual, right? So yeah, um, I don't, I definitely don't think that there's a one size fits all. And I think it can, I think the most pragmatic way is to almost sit with yourself as if yourself is your board of directors. If you had a, you know, larger company and say, Hey self, what are my business's goals and how, what's that going to cost me? And how am I going to fund that? And yeah. you can fund that from your own balance sheet, which is taking the excess cash above your minimum to live 
and reinvest that you can there's all kinds of ways you can do that but like and i think you can be evaluated every six months every year every two years i think it depends on the cadence of, of the business itself but um, yeah. there should be a, pro- a process of which to say okay this is what i made this is what i drew this is how i used it here's what's changed in my life i need to adjust the amount that i need to to draw or to get paid as a salary i don't want to do with the excess yeah i think um, and there are tax considerations i think and i but i i, I think back to rob's point though i would always if the fundamentals don't work and you're living and dying on the ability to expense a business meal that you didn't have the ability to expense before your business is failing (laughs) that's a good point i was what i (laughs) what i was gonna say is um i think there is like squishy territory in um and sort of like addressing the line about like what it is you need to live. And I think it's interesting because like, that's obviously a broad concept, right? It's highly individual for everybody. But I think the thing that's interesting about it is if you can be a little bit more, um, if you can be, if you can apply a lot of scrutiny to that, to that phrase or to that, like that category of expense, I think what it introduces is the concept of like investment, which you taught, we, you, t- you raised initially as a, as a, um, um, as a way to sort of treat excess cash. But I think like you can also apply the concept of reinvestment to the sort of territory that, um, covers what you need to live on or not. And so in other words, like if you are a little bit more lean with your personal expenses and you find the business uh, there as a be- as a benefit as a as a result of that has a little bit more excess cash to deploy. I think where a lot of small business owners like miss an opportunity is thinking about like what should come as a function of that reinvestment, right? So like large businesses are very good at this, or sophisticated investors as a group are sort of good at this, like thinking about it, an investment in terms of like, mm-hmm. what should the result of that investment be? And small business owners generally as a group are less sophisticated in terms of applying that thinking to their business because they think about an expense. Like I think the first order thinking for a lot of small business owners is like expense equals tax benefit. When I think like a more mature business thinks about like expense related to what's the reinvestment uh, result of that expense, right? Whether it's like an operating expense that you're expecting, you know, to see some like growth of the business or it's a um, like a direct cost expense where you're looking for like a very like immediate sort of like result of that relative to like a gross margin type relationship or something. But I think, I think there's, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of territory there in terms of like being able to advise small business owners um, a- about this. Right. And so we talked about this, like in the, in the workshop that we just mm-hmm. did where it's like expenses. And I think this, I probably stole this from you, Jason. This is like, I loved your, you know, you, you, I think you, in some of our conversations, you have framed expenses as investments. And I just, I love that for everything that I'm just, for the reasons I'm talking about right now. Um, and I think like thinking about expenses as multiples of benefit, um, not just like in a gauzy way, but just like there should be a result from this is if you can, if you can sort of like morph into that mindset, you can probably like, you know, I mean, just take a, take an example, right? It's like, if you were reinvesting 50 cents of every personal dollar you spent and you were getting like three or four X the benefit of that, you would probably be a little bit more discerning about your personal expenses, right? But we tend in in like the ultra small business territory, we tend not to think in those terms. And we think like, oh, I'll put this on the business card because like, it'll be less that I pay in tax, you know? And I think that's only like the first order consequence thinking rather than um, like a bigger opportunity you can apply. Agree, disagree? Yeah. I don't want to be the only one talking. So, but yeah, well, I think the yeah, other yeah, thing yeah. too is just like what what are the end goals of the of the business, and is it to like if it's to grow enterprise value over time? Obviously, you know the more that you the more fuel you can add to the fire, 
um, as, as early as possible in the business is going to result in accelerating the enterprise value many years down the road. And so anything you can do to limit the amount of ancillary unnecessary expense um, that can, that would like re and redirect that into the re back into the business just makes, just makes a ton of sense. There's going to be people though, who, who are optimizing for something other than enterprise value. And, and that's where things get, things get a little squishy. And when you're talking about enterprise value, just to clarify, you're just talking about like creating uh, value for the business that could be accessed in some, at some point, right? Is that what you mean by that? Correct. Yeah. 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 So, um, by the way, um, want to just make sure that acknowledge our guests, only child overtake here, almost outnumbering advisors on this call. Um, but please, uh, so good That's to awesome. have you guys on the call and um, jump in like at any time with any questions. This is not just like a, this is not a, this is not like a one-sided conversation intended to be. Um, but, um, yeah, I think, um, I think Rob, you and I talk about this a lot, like, for the the framework for a lot of our discussions with clients is can be sort of like bifurcated on that basis. Like, what is your intent with like what's your intent with the business? Like, is your business here to uh, like are you trying to build something and sell it, or are you trying to just like maximize like your personal gain from an income standpoint? And like, depending on where somebody is. Uh, at the current moment relative to their thinking, like that's going to deliver different outcomes in terms of the guidance that, that, that we would be inclined to give. Do you agree with that? Totally. And I, yeah, and I'm, I'm always curious about Jason's take on this because I feel like he's, he's, he's always insightful on some of this, but you know, I've, I've worked with not necessarily clients that act in this particular way, but I've worked with other business owners who, I've optimized their small business to support a lifestyle that they want. And they, you know, they're a husband and wife team and they want to, they want to be able to work with interesting people across the country or across the world and, and travel and, and, um, you know, they might be selling a product that requires them to be traveling to Hawaii to take, you know, photo shoots and things like that and go to trade shows in Europe and, um, and to support and, you know, the business ne doesn't necessarily make tons and tons and tons of money from a, from a purely financial perspective, but it's giving them the lifestyle that they love. It's allowing them to interact with the people that they want to interact with and have friends around the, around the globe. And when you look at the P and L you look at a business that doesn't necessarily feel like it's, you know, super successful, but you know, those, those are people that may not ever want to sell that business or don't, aren't necessarily seeking um, maximum enterprise value for the long term and wanting to sell it, sell it off, but they're interested in having the lifestyle that they want. And are, it allows them to save some money um, in a more aggressive fashion than perhaps they would working at W2 and it gives them what they're needing in a bunch of different, def, a bunch of different areas. And if that's making them happy and giving them the life that they want, like, more power to them. So, um, and there's, I think there's a lot of, I feel like there's a lot of entrepreneurs who are in that boat who um, are work for themselves because they might be, you know, there's a lot of entrepreneurs that are unemployable in other areas because they have, a, have a certain lifestyle, uh, certain lifestyle wishes that they want to be able to, you know, not have to answer to anybody else or want to be able to do things that they want to do on their time frame, work the hours that they want to work. And so that lifestyle works for them. Um, and so I think it's just like, what's the con what's the context and, and, you know, if you're able to use your business in a way that allows you to hit your goals, like it may not be, it may not be about optimizing like your income okay. per se. It's, it's something, it's something other than that. And they might, you might not require a huge income if, if, um, you know, you're living a fairly simple life and you're doing the things you want to do. Yeah. What um, I think, yeah. I think in that in that in that instance, Rob, that you, you described, so you've got you know a couple sells maybe a travel product. They've optimized for traveling, social media, et cetera, et cetera. But they're still meeting the minimum amount that they need to live. Now, to live might be different because they might not have to pay for a place 
to sleep at night because that's covered by their business, but they still have other costs to live, right? So, you know, for some people to live could be thousands and for some people it could be tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands a month, right? It just depends on, I think, what to live means to them. Means, for sure, for sure. But that 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 lifestyle, I guess what I'm trying to point out is that lifestyle, if you were working a W-2 job, would be very, like you'd have a, a making, I'm not making some assumptions, but you're, you're, you're working a normal job and then you're trying to itch your track, you're trying to um, scratch that travel itch um, in your, in your vacation time versus running a business that allows you to do that in in terms of your day to day and the and the requirements from an income perspective in one scenario versus the other might be like on paper might be completely different. Like what you take home might be might be different because you're using you're leveraging the the business um op, opex to, to do to fulfill that need for you. And so um your your true like salary requirements might be might be small. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um. Yeah, I mean, I just, I just think a lot about like, tangent. That's I'm t- taking us down a tangent. That's that's kind of odd, but I mean, the bottom line it's is, no, I think I, that it's, well, I mean, it's the it's the it's the, cl- it's the classic example of like every business is different, and what you pay yourself. Just like I think you f- you you naturally find a little bit of what works for you based on just who who you are as a person and the type of business that you're building. I, I think what's important is it's, it can be fluid too. Like you know, just um. You know, if if and that's the beauty of like owning your own, for the most part, owning your own business, and depends on the type of business you do. But like, if you want to make more, you can do more work. Usually, they're correlated. I mean, it's not necessarily always the case, but the idea is, is like, if you're, especially if you're selling your time, right? If you're professional services, you're selling your time. You can, you want to make more money, go sell more time. If that means you got to work 45 hours and you work 45, but you make more money, right? Like in those types of benefits, you don't get when you're a you know, W two wager. On the flip side of that, you know, if you if the business needs more money and you don't selling enough work, then you know, cover its fixed expenses. Then you're putting money in, right? So, you know, it's that that's blessing and the curse. But I mean, I think for for most people, they struggle a lot with this. Like, well, how much should I pay myself? And like, they'll go out and look at market comps and they'll try and say, well, if I if I was doing this as a W two, this is how much I'd make. So that's how much I should make here. Those are all very reasonable. I think it's up to the individual. Those are all reasonable ways to value your time, like in that exchange of work and time and money, right? Um, but you know, I, I, I guess to to Jamie to answer you, this is a very is I don't think there's a one size fits all for this. Um, and other people, I think it's important. I've seen this successfully in the past is to align even within your own ownership um, incentives with um effort right so like you know we, it, there's nothing wrong with saying hey i'm going to pay myself x but if we accomplish y then i'm going to pay myself another x times two mm-hmm. like you can be you can bonus yourself the same way you bonus you get a bonus at work right like you can make yeah. it sales commission based you can there and that's the game like the gamesmanship a little bit that like can be you know what you pay yourself might actually like drive how successful you are if you can maybe tie that to business objectives and think about like your compensation the same way you know you might think of uh like a salesperson right like or something like that so i've seen business owners be very methodical about like okay i take 10 percent of cash collected every month mm. back to your point of like is there a yeah so 10 percent of cash collected every month that drives you to collect as much cash as you can Right. So it it self aligns the interest. That's a highly disciplined business owner. I love that. But that is a that is that is a challenge. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have, or, or, can yeah. I pose a quick question real quick, just as a please. Is that a good time? Okay, great. Yep. So I wanted to kind of dip back into what Rob was saying, and I'm interested in this because at Only Child we have a unique situation, which was initially it was just my company alone. And so in a sense it was like I could look at my, and I was, I sort of was triggered by a thing you said, which was basically like, I could have the income that I was giving myself, but a lot of my life could live under this, under the sort of umbrella of the business. And I don't mean I'm using it as an ATM so much as there are goods and services that I'm able to do. So that might be, so we're in the film production. So going out to movies, 
uh, subscriptions to any streaming services. Like there's a whole sort of host of services that sort of fell under that thing that I could kind of live under the umbrella. So in other words, I, it, what I'll call soft money, I was paying myself in soft costs through that business. And then I was earning this, this thing. That was when I was an individual. As you see, there's two other guys here. Now we have to sort of live under a somewhat more like specific income because that eventually got us into trouble where it's like, this is how much we're paying each other. And this is much more specific. What's interesting to me is I think that the, a lot of those services, goods and services or things that the business could be providing universally. So for instance, like just to give a silly example, like let's say streaming services, like a streaming service can be something that we have one central subscription for that is relevant to our business that is a tax write-off that basically all three of us could be using in our homes that we don't need to all three of us be paying several hundred dollars a month for services that are relevant to our business model so what i'm interested in is like going back now and saying okay we have a fixed sort of income for matthew fixed income for myself and spencer but where are those things that I was doing previously that were totally within the tax? Like they, those were totally, and those are going to amount to a lot of money over the course, course of a year. So I think like it was an interesting transition to go from individual to partners, but still try to find ways to sort of make that business work for us in ways that were totally legal and helpful. I'll go mute if you guys have thoughts on that. Take, your, take the answer off the air. I'll right. take long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> Do we want to preface this with like we're not giving legal or tax <laughs> yeah, advice? Yeah, on this yeah, call? yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Good, good call, good call. Rob, what kind? What a prof you. Seek oh, professional oh, help. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you want to? I feel uh, like you're you you're you're you've kind of lived this life a little bit that Sam's talking about, at least most recently. Not in the exact same way, but um, I don't know. Curious what your thoughts are. Do you do you have do you feel like you're clear on what he was describing? Yeah, and I feel like in some ways it's like it's some like some ways it's a Jason question because I don't know the, the ins and outs of the tax tax code. But the bottom line is, I do think that um, I, I would I would I guess push back and and say say number one, I do think that when you're a soul proprietor you're like you're the only one in the business like you probably treat things a little bit differently than when you've got more more people involved and scrutinizing like having a little bit more scrutiny for the expenses that you guys are taking on um on a regular basis is pretty important because what became what was a single expense for one of you if you start to triple it because you guys are all owners now and and um, you all have, all have a kind of somewhat access to the same, the same benefits, like things, things from an expense side can get out of hand pretty quickly. So I think like just operationally thinking through like what truly are the things that we want or need in terms of expense and making sure that they're necessary for the business is an important, like part of the exercise to go through. Now, with that said, I, like, are there things that you guys are all, all, all paying for that you could combine or try to optimize um and have the business pay for as an ordinary expense of the business make i think makes sense um so going through that exercise and talking through it um on, in terms of what's necessary and, and what can be brought together to me seems like it's uh, an exercise that's worthwhile jason i don't know if you have anything to I, yeah, no, I, mean, I like how challenge on, how challenge me on. you're answering that, Rob. Very carefully answering <laughs> that. <laughs> Jason, have you I seen need... this example, this scenario where there's like multiple owners sort of incurring like in like effectively like multiplying like expense as a function of being like having additional ownership? Have you seen that kind of thing play out before? Uh, yeah, a couple times, and sometimes it's uh, uh, it doesn't end well. If I think the most important thing is everybody understands what those shared expenses are, and if we're going to continue to do them, that everybody's getting the same or that I hate to use the word equal because it's not really equal, but fair benefit to that, and is an agreement with that being a business expense, right? Now, there's you know whether it can or cannot from a 
tax code perspective is one question, but really it's like as a, as a partnership, did we all agree that every time we go out for drinks, it's business drinks? Great. And if I do that, you do that. He does. Everybody does that. Right. Okay, great. And we know that if one person's buying a thousand dollar bottles of wine, we're all splitting it a third, a third, a third. And if the other person's buying $10 Miller lights, third, a third, a third. And as long as everybody's agreed that that's one and the same, okay, that's fine. The issue becomes, especially in partners is if the thousand dollar bottle of wine person is, you know, not telling the $10 Miller light person, the Miller light person's like, I would never do that. That's, that's egregious. We would never do that as a business. Then you have problems. Right. 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 Uh, and that's really like partnership problems, but to the, like, should you take advantage of that? Yeah. hundred percent. Um, yeah, I think it has as long as everybody do... agrees with what that is. Yeah. You know? I think it has less, I think it's more of a system space thing where it's, it's less like what I did for lunch today with a potential lead that's sort of like on I mean, those will always kind of exist, but I'm more thinking of like systemic things that are monthly whether they're subscription based or their services that have that sort of like squishy to use y'all's word, like between what's business versus what can also be leveraged for personal. But I just think it's like, I think there's redundancies in a scenario like mine and, and Matthews and Spencer's that are, it'd be interesting for small business owners, especially in a case like mine that went from just me to multiple to find those redundancies that are totally with totally legal. I don't think these are like where I'm not pushing the envelope here, but I, I get the like value system you're pointing out, Jason, of like my, you know, champagne budget, beer, whatever, beer budget, champagne taste, like this kind of scenario of happening between partners, which I've seen firsthand happen where I had a partner in Denver that I worked for and he had a partner in San Francisco and they had, you know, totally different tastes. One guy's, yeah, drinking Miller Lights and the other guy. Literally, your example is true to true to form. So, and that event eventually sunk the company because it was just like one guy was going for gold and the other guy was trying to stay like working class blue collar, and it just didn't work ultimately. Um, so, I just was bringing it up because I think it's interesting that I had lived that life of like making the business kind of work within the specter of what's legal and what's normal, and and sort of had this soft income. Yeah, you know, but yeah, yeah, and, and three of us, it's with, more complicated. Without exposing you to, like, do you did you when you brought in these other partners? Was it the the concept of like, okay, if your cost of living, and I use living like broadly, is ten thousand dollars, but you know, you're only going to get nine thousand because you're going to get a thousand dollars of. We're now covering your cell phone bill. We're covering all this stuff. And was it the idea like you, you were like you're getting that benefit. So you're going to take home less. And we just need to all be on the same page about that. That's more or less what I'm saying. It's sort of like, yeah. I personally, I used to bury a lot of my life costs into the business because, you know, I didn't have partners, so I didn't worry about it. So rather than yeah. totally like, rather than audit that and figure out how it could benefit every partner, it's now just removed. So now I got to, you know, just take an income yourself. into my personal account yeah. and pay that out. But I'm wondering if it was a little rash to not sort of audit the things that cost money. I mean, we could use a much more normal thing, which would be like healthcare costs, right? Or yeah. like the company yeah, might make a decision phone. that people can have mental or okay. physical healthcare costs covered up to this number. We can make it much more above the line, but it's just interesting the transition from that to that and just thinking how you can make the business work for the different partners in this small business scenario, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that's a that's a very good question. I think you probably could have gone either way on how you on how you does. The other thing I've seen common would be is that each owner has their own LLC and kind of then nests those expenses at their at their individual level. Which also is like, if you want to be more aggressive than maybe another partner as it relates to interpretation of what is and is not a business expense, that's a decision that you make. So like, because if you make it on behalf of the entity, the, the entity could be audited and that could have an impact on every partner because of the results of that, right? So. That's a great point. You can you uh, can also think about like, well, who and where and risk and like, oh, well, I'm much more risky and so sure. yeah, you can also like have individual LLCs that hold your entity shared together. So right on. That's that's a great point. Well, thank you guys. I think I have to dip as well, but I look forward cool. to getting the full recording. And thank you thanks, so much. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thanks for coming yeah. on. Yeah. All right, later. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you guys. Take care. All right, see ya. Um. Okay, cool. That was awesome. So glad you gave us a live example. Um, so 
the, I think the category just to spend some remaining time is like, I think it would be interesting to talk about. So we've sort of like talked about the, the subset of owners who might be sort of like right at the line struggling to sort of, um, s sort of normalize, um, like personal expenses relative to the performance of the company, but it would be interesting to touch on the group, the, the owners who are operating like in the sort of like in the atmosphere above that, which is like, they have excess capital, uh, you know, sort of, in their business to consider how to deploy that, like whether, you know, they just like give themselves a raise or they um, like, you know, reinvest that in the business and um, just kind of curious what comes to mind. I mean, I, I, I think at the danger of getting ahead of myself and answering a portion of this question myself, like what would make most sense from a logical standpoint of like how to reinvest your money, it would be into the thing that is, like giving you the highest rate of performance for the company. But that is a broad statement. And I'm just kind of curious to see, to hear if you guys have any examples of, you know, people uh, like, uh, yeah, I know you have an example, but just like what your examples are or what things come to mind of places that owners can deploy excess capital into the business and and really see the benefit of that like judicious thinking rather than just like taking home additional personal gain. Um, any, any thoughts on that? I think from like a, just a, ba a really basic level, if you've got excess, it depends on the size of the business, but if you've got excess earnings that can be deployed, it's just like, where, where is the business at and what are the next steps that need to be taken? So is it a business that need like could benefit from some more, you know, do they need a new software system? And like to get to the next level, do you, like if when you double the business, you know, things tend to break in certain areas, like, and it might be implementing software, it might be hiring more people, it might be putting in like a true, like true HR, true HR team or a true marketing team or a true sales team. And like, is that the next level that you're trying to get to? And if so, like, what are the, what are the building blocks to doing that? And I think that's assuming that the fundamental answer to the question is, is the business the right place to put the, put the excess capital into? Like, right. do you believe that the business has enough upside to, to, to go there? And if the answer is yes, I mean, those are the places that, that I would look. Yeah. There might be people though, who, who, who are operating a business in an area where they're feeling like they're tapped out or they're, the growth, there are they're other growth, growth opportunities elsewhere and they might, um, that they're going to pull the cash out of the business and redeploy it into, you know, real estate or other investments outside of the business. Um, or they're, or they want to use the tax code and they want us to make, they may even just want to put, put more away for their own personal retirement. I mean, I think that there's lots of, lots of different directions it could, it could go. It's just a matter of what's, where's the business at and what is the owner thinking and where are they in the life cycle and are they trying to maximize um value for the for the for the business or is they or, or are they trying to maximize value personally um and that might influence the direction that they want to go with it yeah i mean the the very like premise of the question like introduces or sort of like assumes some long-term thinking right because the classic example is like owner has a great year buys a bunch of trucks to like you know personally you know like sort of in that sort of territory Go by the like, ski boat yeah yeah well like <laughs> there's the whole category here right i mean basically there's a whole industry <laughs> being propped up by like very successful like roofers landscape companies anything like on two or four wheels or with a jet on the back uh, but i mean like that's the classic <laughs> example right is like you know like landscaper has like a million dollar year buys like some you know toys that like you know, yeah, you can plow snow, plow snow with like a side by side, you know, <laughs> but like, <laughs> so like, that's the scenario. So like, you know, in that, but I mean, I understand the tension, right? Because it's like, you're like, if you have a, a year where you're generating like an outsized amount of money, like the first thing you're going to seek to protect is like your, your own like financial liability relative to that earning. Right. And so like, if you, if you sort of like make if you if you show some restraint on that you know on that um 
sort of on that side of things and decide to take like a longer term view and say like, okay, I'm not going to just try to like, you know, claim like a 20, you know, reduce like a million dollar earnings into like, you know, an $80,000 income. I'm instead going to, you know, reinvest this money like into the business so that in four years I can have a $4 million a year instead of a million dollar a year. Like that, that takes some restraint, some like trust in what you're doing. Some, you know, that's, that's very much like a long-term perspective, but I think it's hard for business owners to sort of like get beyond that sort of like looking out for themselves from a personal liability standpoint. And you, I think I, yeah, I just see a lot of owners like trapped in this like circular reference of make some money, spend it on stuff I don't really need to reduce my tax liability. And then like, you just kind of like, you're just kind of going sideways in that scenario for a long time. I don't know. Um, curious what thoughts you guys have on that. Well, I think you're bringing up a, an interesting like overarching theme, which is small business owners historically don't plan and set goals or objectives relative to those plans. Yeah, that's a good call. Such so, like, a if, mature, we, if we just like, if we statement. just, <laughs> I, I'm guilty of not doing it too. Like, I, I say, say as I say, you know, do as I say, not as I do. But, um, you know, I think like if you know, so if you, if you sit there and you say like, look, I'm gonna, you know, we're, we're we've got a hundred thousand dollars of excess cash. I'm going to reinvest that into marketing. I expect my sales next year to be two hundred thousand dollars more than they are this year. So I'm going to get a two times return on my advertising and marketing spend. Yeah. Okay, great. So go do it and then write it down and then check yourself in 12 months and see if it worked. And if it did, then you have a new lever in your tool chest, which is like, okay, great. Now, now I, you know, I, there's all kinds of macro fat forces and like, a, but like for all intents and purposes, you now have a lever that's, that says, Hey, I can invest this capital in this way. And this is the return I can get. That's very valuable as you think about the next year, the next decision you get to make, right? Which is like, yeah, you know, do I want to have a short-term decrease in personal pay to make long-term value creation? And I think you, you know, so so set a plan, set a goal, execute it, and then check it. And I think like doubling back to kind of Rob's point is, is like, if your goal is to sell the business, and maybe your goal is to sell the business within a year or two years, it's probably better to like, you know show more earnings to yourself and, and, you know, whether you take the cash out of the business or not, and whether it's an LLC or a C corp or whatever is like, dude, these are different discussions, but um, that's going to, because most businesses, small businesses are valued on a multiple of sellers, discretionary earnings. And it's a hell of a lot easier to sell a business when you say, look, here's my business, here's my tax return, here's what the earnings were, and this is a multiple of that. Versus, well, here's my earnings, and I did all this other personal stuff, and I put this boat in here. You don't really need the boat, and you went on the trip, but you don't really need the trip. And I, that's really hard. Yeah. It's really hard to justify. Um, I mean, I think it's well known. Bought a small business. We had zero seller ad backs in that business, which is one reason why I almost paid what he listed it for. Yeah, yeah. Because it felt like a good, fair deal. Like the tax right. return equaled the financials. There was no like, oh, funny I business. didn't. Have... Yeah, yeah. I've gone and probably made it a little bit more funny since then. <laughs> That's because maybe I'm a little bit more aggressive. But um, but like that, that was one inherent value to like, it made it really easy to do that, right? Yeah. Like bank had no questions. Like it was very easy. So yeah. if your goal is to sell it too, like, you know, you, you just operate it as the going concern needs to operate that business. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think, and I think to, I mean, to your Go point ahead. too, it's also helps when the, when the owner's wages are aligned with the market so that if you're, if you're a buyer into that business, you can say, you know, you can either run it yourself and make theoretically the same as what the previous owner made, or you've got now the ability to say, okay, if I plug a GM into that role, there's still some, there's still some, earnings that the business has, even if I plug somebody else into it and it seems reasonable and it's straightforward and there's no funny business there either. So like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of reasons to like take a salary that is like fair and reasonable for the work and the efforts that are, are being had. Um, yeah. In normal, normal operations. Yeah. Um, yeah. We've sort of wandered into some like, touched on a couple of topics that I'm not sure people will understand, but in small business, 
when you sell a business, as Jason described, it's usually the formula for understanding the value of that business is based on effectively, well, for small businesses, this term called seller discretionary earnings. And when your earnings are comprised of things other than just like strictly a salary that is like market based or, you know, very close to that sort of parameter and is comprised instead of um, like personal benefits to you that only you would discern as a benefit rather than the next buyer. So like, you know, the, class, the example that we've been sort of like riding on is like the boat example. So like if you bought a boat to compensate for yourself and you claim that as compensation as a way that you run the business currently, but then as you go to sell the business, you explain to that person that, oh, that was just my decision, but it's in the category of what the business used to pay you as a compens as the owner to run the business. It gets messy and it turns what would otherwise be a more straightforward conversation about value into a uh, interpretation. And that is very hard to pin down uh, like in the transaction stage. So um, anyway, uh, but it's a, it's, it's a super valid point and goes kind of back to that initial framework that we visited about like, what is your goal with this business? And are you just trying to sort of like milk it, you know, for personal gain, or do you have goals um, relative to the infrastructure that you're building and how those could benefit you uh, over time and, you know, hopefully benefit like other people as well. Um, awesome. Do you guys have any additional thoughts? We've, we've, this has been like a wide ranging, great conversation. No, just to, I guess, just to put a pin in that final comment that you made, like you can't, like if you're trying to build a business that has value to sell down the road, like treating your business as a personal piggy bank yeah, and leveraging the tax code to the max is probably not going to get you to where you want to be. Like it's, yeah. you've got to kind of, you got to chart that path. And that goes back to Jason's comments on like planning and what do you want this thing to be and, and what's your long-term goals and, and really kind of starting at that very fundamental level. Because if you don't, you don't do that um it gets things get really kind of off and squishy in a lot of ways and so um if your goal is like no i want to build this business and i want to sell it in a few years like running really clean books and running really tight on your on your comp compensation and making sure that it's tied to the market and trying you know like those are things that are just like paramount to being able to um extract the highest value for the business when it does come time to sell but some people aren't into that. So you just kind of have to make that choice early on. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's yours. Yeah. So make whatever damn decision you want. Like just, <laughs> under, just understand what the consequences are. <laughs> like your like, actions have consequences. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. But you know, I mean like, yeah. So uh, there's not a one size fits all. I'm always, I'll say a little weary when somebody's like, well, I was making X at my job. And so I need to make at least that times two. Yeah. Like, I don't know if your motivations are the right motivations. And for some people that works. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. But like, um, just be clear what the motivations are and then align to those and you'll create something that's very fulfilling, very profitable and has a lot of enterprise value and ultimately just run a good business. Yeah. It's not that simple. I know. Um, All right. So speaking of planning or the lack thereof, I forgot to introduce you guys. I had it written down and everything. And I just jumped in. I saw you guys and I was like, let's talk about this. So Jason, can you just introduce yourself for the people who might not be familiar with you? Sure. Um, my name is Jason. I run a uh, primarily bookkeeping and accounting business for small businesses We uh, and startups. Um, been doing that for about five years, but I've been doing this work for about 15, either as a early stage employee or founder of a handful of different companies from a bootstrapped um, granola cereal business to a venture backed insurance technology spin out of a large brokerage. So I've kind of been through uh, all spectrums of different sizes. Um, and then I mentioned in the call, which I don't know if you're going to cut this to the beginning or not, but um, that I also, uh, my wife and I also run a van rental business. So we have a small business we bought. So I went through the process of uh, purchasing that, getting an SBA loan. And so I'm familiar and intimate with uh, buying a small business as well. So awesome. Rob, 
Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, Rob Boson. Um, I'm one of the advisors here at Arbark, and my past is <laughs> wild and varied. Uh, started my career uh, in the corporate world, um, worked for Fortune 500 companies in a variety of roles, um, from technology to systems implementation. Um, spent some time as a finan in financial planning, doing personal financial planning, and then um, also uh, got the itch to become a, an entrepreneur and started a small uh, stand-up paddleboard and canoe business. We so we do we did much import work as well as domestic manufacturing, and uh, I recently exited and sold that business. And so um, my advice tends to come from like the war wounds and the wins and the losses that come along from came along from that. Um, also act, um, been in the sales world for a while, acting as an independent um, manufacturer's rep uh, for multiple outdoor brands. And so I've got a lot of insight into um, just the way that world works. And so I've got to see the inner workings of a bunch of different small, small to, I guess, medium and large businesses along the way um, from a kind of an outside perspective as well. So I've um, been able to see some things that have gone well and gone poorly over the years there too. So um, lots of varied experiences over the past. So happy to be here. Awesome. Well, we all have that in common, the variation, the varied nature of our experiences. Um, and I'm Jamie, the founder of Aardvark. You probably interacted with me. I'm one of the owners of Aardvark. My wife and I run this business together. In fact, when you were talking about a husband and wife type business that likes to go to Hawaii, I was feeling, <laughs> I was feeling indicted going to trade shows. And luckily that doesn't, uh, that doesn't apply to us, but it started to description felt very accurate for a period of time. And then it, <laughs> then it dovetailed, <laughs> but um, yeah, all we do is think about uh, the, the experience small business owners are having and how, how to help them out financially. We have a few different ways of doing that. And um, if you'd like to learn more about that, you can e reach out to Rob or I. And I'm um, so grateful to you guys for the conversation. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you. Appreciate right. it. You got it. See you guys. See ya. Yeah. See ya.